first um, presentation is John Peacock and Elena Rader, who are here from the Colonial Theater of Shakespeare, which is in Rhode Island, which is where I got my PhD, so, and my mother grew up there. So if you're not familiar with it, it's, this, it's about the size of Texas. <laughs> in New England, um, and you can cross it in about 10 minutes. Um, and the Colonial Theater is a Shakespeare-based, not-for-profit professional theater company that does um, free productions of Shakespeare in southern Rhode Island in the summer. And if you haven't been to Rhode Island, Summer in Rhode Island is much nicer than summer many other places. <laughs> so they can do, you know, Shakespeare in, in the summer, and so you should probably go. <laughs> it's fabulous. And our second spe speaker is Haya Wong, who's going to be talking about developing young Shakespeare in Asia within Asian Shakespeare Intercultural Archive, and is talking about working with theater for young audiences, which focuses on a targeted audience experience. And so we will be hearing from each of them, and then we'll have questions. So welcome. Thank you so much. I'm Elena Rader. Hi, I'm John L. Peacock. Uh, we are the co-artistic uh, directors of education for the Colonial Theater. It's a bit of an interesting title, but it really speaks to <laughs> what we're doing uh, and what we're presenting today uh, with the Colonial Theater. Uh, we were brought on um, as teaching artists for this partnership uh, that the Colonial Theater, as a professional not-for-profit um, theater in southern Rhode Island uh, that focuses on producing uh, Shakespeare uh, in the park, uh, production uh, every summer. Um, uh, they have partnered with Westerly High School, which is, um, the company is based out of Westerly, Rhode Island, and the high school is just the local high school there. It's the public high school that's uh, unfortunately not had a program of uh, theater of any sort for uh, roughly a decade. And uh, this partnership was to help um, create a, a, a a co-op situation where the Colonial can come in as a professional company to help create the foundation of uh, theater programs so that then we could take a step back and let a full-time teacher run with it uh, for hopefully centuries to come. <laughs> uh, so yeah, let's, let's just dive right in. Uh, a little brief background, uh, both of us uh, grew up and uh, experienced theater uh, in high school uh, in our public schools uh, individually. Uh, and then we went on and both uh, received our undergraduate uh, degrees, our uh, bachelor degrees in theater. Uh, we look back at that experience as, oh, it was so fun and it was so nice to be slightly exposed to theater in high school and then we really learned our craft in, in college. Uh, and we wanted to take an artistic approach to the education of these students and of this community uh, and instead of dividing the two and really just being in there as teachers and saying, okay, here's what theater is for you non-theater students, and there you go, and if you want anything else, go to college, and then you'll learn. <laughs> we wanted to say, if, uh, we are showing you how a professional company works, what a professional company does to make that work, both uh, on the acting aspect and the uh, technical aspect and everything else. And if you love it, great, you can continue with that. If, you, if you're like, ah, ambivalent, great, you still have a learning experience uh, that we feel is very uh, uh, genuine. Um, so. Uh, yeah, and we'll get into more of this later, but I think also just really giving the students agency to voice their opinions. I think so often, I'm not sure what it's like in the UK, but I think so often in America, there's so much emphasis placed on testing that it's like, Memorize this, get the right answer, move on to the next thing. We have to do chapter two now and forget all that and then get the right answer and then move on to chapter three. And, so and, and, so about yeah. Yeah. and so for us, you know, we were like, if you don't like this, that's fine, but tell us why and have an argument to back it up and you know have that agency and you know, have that voice. And also just the idea of and we'll talk about this more a little bit later in the talk, but just the idea of product versus 
process. Um, I think oftentimes an educational leader, um, which you were speaking to a little bit with the um, public acts, you have to get the pro like the production has to happen. Like the show has an opening date, and how can we dive into the craft and the process and not just have it be about the finished product and that exploratory time? A, a brief background about the theater itself. Uh, it was established in 1985 in west of the Rhode Island. Uh, it, uh, from 1991, it has been producing every summer the outdoor Shakespeare, always for free. Uh, it's a collaboration with a, a beautiful uh, park that's owned by the local library, funny enough, and they maintain it in this wonderful way. It's almost a, a botanical garden and uh, a museum of, of nature in this small little lovely area. Um, and we have come in since 91 to produce a uh, free professional grade Shakespeare. So, meaning it's tens and tens of thousands of dollars to mm -hmm. raise the money and put on the production, but the production is free to the people who come to see it, which is a, a tricky balance for a theater company to raise all that money and then not charge anything for it, but we, we feel it's you know important for the community to have the ability to see it. Yes, and because of that, we've really established a tradition of this uh, full access theater uh, full access Shakespeare in this community that people have relied on because it's now several decades old at this point. Mm -hmm. And that really was the, the, the brainchild and the impetus for this partnership with Westfleet High School that started. Uh, the initial plans were in uh, 2017. 2018 is when uh, things really, uh, the ball started rolling, in, so to speak. For Westfleet High, they're the Bulldogs. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and it's uh, a <laughs> yeah, they, they've had, uh, they have roughly 12 coaches, uh, they have two cosmetic teachers, uh, they have one music teacher, and up until this uh, year they've had zero theater teachers for over a decade. Um, go back just to give a little bit more of them. There we go. <laughs> uh, like I was saying, since 2008, no theater program. Uh, and because of that, they've been really seeing a sharp uh, uh, decrease of student enrollment because there are charter schools and other uh, public schools that are available to the students that uh, they are going there very much saying because there is not a good enough arts program, uh, either musical, or uh, uh, music, singing, or especially theater. Um, in that time, in that interim between 2008 and now, they've tried to establish a new theater program by asking an English teacher to do so. Um, my, my, my personal experience was uh, we had a, our special ed teacher stepped up and became our theater teacher when the old theater teacher left. And so I understand that uh, a, a teacher who's not specifically well versed in theater coming in and wanting to uh, share the love and share the, the experience, um, but there's difficulties with that. Uh, they are very much education-based. They are very much uh, looking at it as a classroom and only a classroom. Um, so it didn't work. Um, the, the English teachers were overstressed and weren't able to uh, get the establishment going, uh, weren't able to put on the plays that the students were really excited about, and they just uh, it just stopped over like, a year or so. Um, and with this school, a third of the population is free or reduced lunch program, which uh, their uh, you know, lower economy is essentially what that translates to in, in crude terms. Uh, and uh, they have a very strong special needs program, which is wonderful. They have uh, guides who uh, uh, go with uh, specific students who need them to every single class, and they one one-on-one -on -one attention. And because of that, there has been a draw for special needs students in this uh, school. And so there's a higher population uh, than the average uh, uh, public high school. Area. The partnership uh, really began in, in 2018 uh, with this after school drama program. This is when Elaine and myself were brought in uh, and we had no production in mind, we had no, no goals but to start to expose the students to this possibility of having theater in their school again. Uh, that uh, led, that was a, a good success and a good start that led into uh, last fall uh, where the after school only program led into a production of Our Town, um, in which 
Um, I have more on that, so I'm, I'm going to skip over that. And well, there's more slides about that one. And right now, uh, the biggest stay success. Tuned. Yeah, stay tuned. <laughs> but wait, there's more. <laughs> the biggest success really has been uh, this semester. Um, we are now teaching in the curriculum. We have a, one theater class. We have students who are uh, signed up for two theater classes next semester. We're very excited about that. Uh, the after school program uh, continues, and uh, we had a musical for the first time at the school for over a decade, and it was You're a Good Man, Charlie Brown. Mm -hmm. um, those who might not be familiar, it's a very popular uh, comic strip of, from the 60s on to today uh, in the United States. And a big part of that was thanks to the Rhode Island Foundation, we received um, a large grant from them in the sum of $45,000, which allowed us to make this program a reality. Because the school basically said, well, the professional theater company has promised this, so you have to fund it. <laughs> and we are a nonprofit, so we did not have the money to fund it. So luckily, we got this grant, and that enabled us to you know, provide the books, get the rights to shows, which are exorbitantly expensive, even your grandma and Charlie Brown is quite costly even at the, you know, the educational level. Uh, so we are hugely grateful for that and we're hoping now that they've seen it come to fruition that they will actually support us with their funds as well. Uh, so Artem, uh, this actually was a student uh, design. Uh, this was the first uh, integration uh, beyond the theater program of other pro uh, established programs of the high school uh, that the head of the arts uh, department uh, put out a challenge for students to create the best design and the best one would become our poster mm -hmm. and our playbill. Uh, and so with that, our town brought the student involvement uh, with the poster design. Um, over uh, roughly about 20 students uh, were involved in, in that, uh, both on stage and as a te the technical crew, a spotlight operator, the uh, light board op and sound uh, board operators. Um, and people started paying attention. Um, so they started to notice that, oh, there's actually something happening and it seems like it could continue on, unlike the other uh, failed attempts in the past decade. Uh, this is one of the stage managers. We actually split the role up into two, if you know the play. It's a lot of lines. <laughs> um, and uh, she is a, uh, a beautiful case of a student who um, really opened up in our program. Uh, she, uh, you know, not to share her story because it's not ours to share, but to let you know that she has uh, had hard times and felt very dis, uh, uh, unconnected from her school, from her classmates. Um, especially from her education, and she is so excited. Uh, she's one of the people who came into our class in, in this semester. Um, she uh, was heavily involved in You're a Good Man, Charlie Brown, and she's just really blossomed in so many ways, both artistically and personally. Yeah, she's someone who comes to school for the theater program, and you know has had some mental health issues, and we've we feel like we've established a safe enough space in which she feels comfortable to share that with us, but also feels comfortable to express herself. She has a bit of a stutter, and um, someone said, oh, that was such a bold choice to cast the student with a stutter as one of the stage managers. And I was like, oh, I didn't even think of it that way. She was just one of the best people for the role. It wasn't like a statement. Um, and I actually find that the stutter goes away the more comfortable she gets. Yeah, very much so. Oh yeah, this is our student design poster for Your Good Man, Charlie Brown, which we just directed this past April. And uh, yeah, they did a nice job on it. We actually had t-shirts made up of this as well, and this was you know, furthering our partnership with the visual arts. Um, and you want to talk about all the things that Charlie Brown brought? Uh, sure. So uh, Your Good Man, Charlie Brown brought more student actors. We had more kids come to the auditions, which was great. This school is very sports oriented, so to pull any of them away <laughs> from the sports teams, I don't want to say it's a victory because obviously I want them to do sports as well, but it, it, it felt like a victory to have more kids come out. I'll say it was a victory. <laughs> um, we also integrated um, our shop department to create the set and use student construction. Um, they did an incredible job. And we also, um, we continued the poster design contest, and we had the art kids come and help paint the set as well. Uh, just an, a few examples of all of this was student-made. Um, the, the house of, uh, the doghouse of Snoopy, 
uh, the doctor is in one of the iconic uh, vi uh, visuals of Charlie Brown, and this is a, a piano, a very small piano in which uh, Schroeder, the character, uh, plays. Uh, constructed, designed, painted fully by the students. And the lights for my, I don't know if we have any technicians in the group, but um, we don't have a lighting grid in this theater because they stripped it because the theater was basically barren and desolate. <laughs> so all these lights you're seeing are on trees that we rented. Mm -hmm. And we actually borrowed the scrim because the school doesn't have a scrim. Um, so we borrowed like the site that you see in the back from uh, another youth theater company in the area. So it was a very you know, community-based effort. Space bar. Mm -hmm. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> the student here uh, is one of our three Charlies, um, because Charlie Brown, uh, we consider an everyman. We wanted to uh, show that experience, so uh, we had uh, one male identifying and two female identifying uh, Charlies, um, and to show of, of different sizes, of different ages, of different many things. Yeah. Um, and he was actually the one who created this cutout. Um, uh, for uh, promotional purposes only, and he, he was Instagram so... Instagram opportunities. Yeah. <laughs> and that's our cast uh, in one of their final poses. So, um, the Colonial as a Professional Entity is doing a Midsummer Night's Dream this summer in the park. Um, and we decided it would be really cool to actually teach it in the curriculum and bridge the professional theater with the school program even farther. So um, <clears throat> something we did that I think I think is unique, but um, feel free to correct me if it's not, <laughs> is we really wanted to focus on Shakespeare as an action. I think oftentimes you're assigned to read Shakespeare and then you have a test on it or you have to write a paper, or in an acting class you're assigned to read the play and then you're assigned a monologue to memorize. And then it's kind of over and you're on to the next thing. And something we really tried to focus on over probably six weeks um, was reading the scene and then writing a journal response. So it wasn't just answer this question. It was like, what did you get out of this? What are the themes? How did you react to it? What do you think of these characters? Do you like them? Do you not like them? Why? Um, and in, in depth discussion of the journal responses and entries. And then sort of like a unrehearsed read aloud the scene on its feet. So we didn't give them proper blocking. We just assigned characters and different characters every every class and then had them actively take part in the scene, so the scene that they had uh, read previously. Following that, by the time we had finished the play, then we broke it down and assigned um, different monologues to the kids and had them memorize them and that was sort of like their final for that um, project. But I don't know, I think we just got really interesting results and it seemed livelier and the discussion seemed, yeah, just more engaged than I've experienced in other classes. So it felt like a good model. And we're really excited because some of the kids will be working on the show with us this summer as fairies or as, you know, stage crew. And for them to be able to, you know, read it, study it, and then see it on a professional level um, is something really exciting. Yeah, they, the students said that they had uh, learned both uh, Midsummer Night's Dream and or, depending on their English class, uh, Romeo and Juliet in their English class. And um, they, no they, sh they noticed and, and told us of the difference um, in our uh, approach of, well, they read it silently. And then in one of the classes, the teacher was really brave and had them sit uh, down and, and read it out loud. So that was good. I mean, it was better than just reading it silently. I, I've always been a big proponent that Shakespeare's not meant to be read. It's meant to be heard. Uh, and so, yes, that was a good step. But then they would have a test of, OK, what character died in this scene? Or, or very much, do you remember this, the scene? And that's it. No opinions, no thoughts. Just do you retain the information? Great, you, you get an A, and let's move on. Let's not talk about it anymore. And so this in-depth discussion and these open-ended journal questions as the start, and then um, each scene being fully on its feet on a stage, which is our classroom. Our classroom is not this. Our classroom is the stage that uh, these students uh, uh, have been performing on for the past two semesters. Uh, and then going into the memorization and, um, and having their final uh, work with that. Also being directed by us for those moments. Uh, that was something completely new, and 
it doesn't really make sense in an English class to be directed by your English teacher, but with theater, obviously that aspect uh, comes in. Also getting them to read the play as an actor versus you know, from an academic point of view. So why is this alliteration here? Why do we have a shared line here? You know, how can I use this to inform my point of view as an actor, um, which I think was pretty foreign to them, and I'm hoping will translate into their other, you know, reading when they read text in English class, like how can they take that on, even if they're not actually acting it? Well, and terms like alliteration, shared line, iambic pentameter, weren't even discussed in their English classes. So these were new terms to them, even though they had already been studying Shakespeare in their high school. So what's the difference? I mean, it sounds like we're just creating a theater program, and that's great. And there's the, what, schools that have theater programs, great. Schools that don't, great, but uh, not great. That's why we're here. <laughs> but what is the difference? Why, why are we different than just bringing in someone who has their education degree and has a, a focus on theater so that they can now teach theater in the, in the high school? We feel it's the professionalism. Uh, not just having a professional attitude, but the fact that we are working artists, that the artists that we bring in um, are working artists. And a major aspect of this semester uh, that we needed to have in there, that we, uh, when speaking to uh, the Rhode Island Foundation about this possible grant that they were so excited about, is to bring in master classes from other professional artists um, that we have connections to so that the, te the students are not only learning from two professional teaching artists who are also actors, but then a, a director comes in, a playwright comes in, uh, the, an actor who uh, has her degree in, um, in, what is it, it's law and medical... Medical science, she's an Aussie. <laughs> <laughs> so. she, she taught uh, and uh, has been teaching this to yeah. adults for a couple of years. This is her first time bringing it to a classroom, but the neuroscience of acting um, and link later work and makeup and costuming. Uh, but also, so. how do these things translate to the real world? Because we're not under the impression that all of our students are going to become professional actors. But just the idea of, you know, specifically the neuroscience of acting, when you have to give a speech, like how do you calm your brain? How do you breathe deeply? We all have to give speeches and we all get nervous for them. So, you know, just. Uh, just like little practical tips that you can utilize in life. Um, you know, the voice and speech thing, like I, for my fellow actors in here, like you hear sometimes someone with a voice and you're like, ah, it's placed so far back, like I could help you <laughs> if you only let me. So just the idea of utilizing your voice as an instrument and letting it be healthy and, and functional. And first understanding that it is a tool that you have. Yeah. And then seeing how you can use that tool and you can help. And what stories do we tell with makeup and costuming? You know, like if you have to dress for a job interview, what what does that look like versus an audition or what does that look like versus, you know, you crawling out of bed and going to class? Uh, just d different silhouettes and that type of very practical stuff that sometimes people don't think about. Yeah. So really showing them direct aspects of the professional theater world but without any of those pressures of the professional theater world. No one was worrying about, you know, losing an audition and, and not having a job or uh, being judged by their fellow actors. Um, the many things that we have to deal with and uh, the people in the professional world just have to deal with, we say, here's what the professional world is, but and if you go into it, you will have to worry about these things and, and losing an audition a uh, hundred times over before you get the parts, et cetera, et cetera, um, but without those pressures quite yet. What's the goal? Uh, well, establish the curriculum. Uh, show the, the incoming uh, teacher who we've already started to speak with, a teacher who, uh, a, a, uh, someone who may be taking over the program in the next year, uh, and we're grooming that person to say, okay, this is how it's different from a standard theater program. This is how it's different from uh, an English class that teaches theater uh, and Shakespeare and show the, the want from the students, show the need from the students, show how students' lives are directly impacted by this theater program, which in the year and a half, especially in the past two semesters, we have seen it and we have been able to show it in a very strong way of many direct examples of students whose lives in small to possibly large, because we don't know, ways have been really directly impacted by this theater program. Uh, creating that standard for uh, for instructors to follow, uh, so 
and not just, uh, I'll talk about that in a minute, but creating the, the standard of professionalism with the code of conduct and the in inclusivity that furthers empathy. And uh, the stats on empathy, especially among college students uh, in the modern world, is are staggering. In the past decade, 40% lower empathy in college students uh, in the United States than were 10 years ago. <coughs> um, and so we're, we and understand And a lot of that, that is technology-based. You know, you're on your screen all the time. You're on your phone. You're not keeping eye contact with people. You're not having a lot of face-to-face -face conversations, even with your friends. It's so interesting. You know, when we go on a, a five minute break or something, oftentimes the kids like don't necessarily talk to each other. They'll sit next to each other, but then they'll be on their phone. Yeah. And that's it. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, so theater, you know, gives them that opportunity to communicate and, and experience empathy. Um, regarding inclusivity, uh, we mentioned the special needs program at our school. Uh, we have several special needs students in our classroom some you know with varying abilities and we sort of adjust and tailor the curriculum to what they are able to do but just one of the most amazing things that i didn't predict before this um, experience was having the other kids rise and lift these kids up and the patience they exhibit with them has just been really mind-blowing to me uh, we had an autistic girl in our cast of your good man charlie brown and i was worried i i didn't want her to I didn't want the kids to feel like they were responsible for her or they had to like tell her when to come in or anything. And she, you know, she's high functioning and, and basically knew when, you know, regarding her cues. But the kids were so kind to her. I think, I think in addition to learning their lines and, and that sense of community, I think they really learned a valuable lesson in just like lifting each other up and that we all are, you know, have those similarities and have that sameness even if we have varying abilities. I think it's one of the biggest surprise successes that we didn't anticipate, but just having the direct interaction with these students who are normally just sitting in a classroom and trying not to raise their hands and, and get to the next class and get home and get away from school as quick as possible and not talking to each other. Um, now, having all of our classes, uh, either in the curriculum or after school, are always in a circle are always where we're not standing up and, and they're all sitting down. If they're standing, we're standing. If they're sitting, we're sitting. And we're all together and we facilitate discussions, but they sometimes lead the discussions and they sometimes take the discussions to places that uh, we didn't know they would go. And it's it always in a beautiful way. Uh, so that's, that surprise success was such a, a, a beautiful aspect of it, especially this past semester. Yeah, we had another special education teacher um, inform us that one of uh, her students feels like theater is the only class in which she's succeeding. Yeah. We're getting close to time. Oh, good. Okay. Yeah, we're, we're getting close to the end. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so as we phase out, as a full-time teacher comes in, the partnership doesn't end there, and that's a big thing. Um, a really uh, brief uh, supplemental uh, education that we have is a summer camp uh, of Shakespeare and, and general theater uh, starting at the age of seven so that we can start to, uh, to groom the future generations that will be coming into this high school so that they won't be brand new and saying, I don't know what, what uh, I'm the pentameter is. Uh, <laughs> and they'll also be excited for it. And they'll be expecting it and they'll be wanting it. So that's a, a huge um, a, a supplemental um, aspect to this education. Um, and then what's immediately next is uh, a young company uh, coming in and doing free training with the professionals as we put on the show, A Midsummer Night's Dream. They'll be understudying and shadowing um, uh, both uh, actors and tech, uh, the director. We have a costumer, uh, a, a technical advisor, all uh, a sound uh, engineer, uh, all interns um, in and around uh, graduating high school age. Uh, that uh, we're helping to bridge that gap between the education and the actual professional world of theater. And also just ensuring that the program is free because. Um, as we continue our broader discussion of diversity in theater, I think one of the biggest hurdles we have, uh, at least I can only speak to the United States, is just the cost prohibitive factors that, you know, voice lessons in New York City are $150 an hour. So of course there's not that many people of color from lower incomes wanting to study voice because who can afford that? I, I can't really afford that. Um, and so, you know, how do we how do we break down those barriers, and how do we include people 
including them in the Shakespeare for free, including them in this free training program, and then finally including it in their school. Yeah. And so the camp and this training program are never going away, and this connection to Westerly High School is will, will have that pathway as uh, it's been used quite a bit lately uh, at our school, and I, I've heard it uh, uh, tossed around, but that pathway to an actual professional career path so that they can, without having to go to a college to learn how to be it, they can start really at the early age and continue with us even when we're phased out of the, the high school in the in curriculum classes. Um, and that's the... Uh, this is not student sharing. drawn, but it's our, it's our production art for the show. And that's the pathway that I was uh, speaking of. Uh, so we will continue with this school indefinitely. And that's one of the big things about the model of having this uh, professional theater, uh, theater come in and help to establish this theater program in the high school. Uh, that's all the pathway that we were talking about. And that's Thank it. You. Thank, Thank you. you. Questions? Um, I'm interested, um, well, I'm interested in both very much because my other language is Chinese, so that's oh, uh, right. an interesting, um, and I do more Shakespeare too. So that's, that's an interesting um, area. But um, I've also been a teacher within the British education system and I don't know if other people would agree but <clears throat> as a teacher of drama and languages uh, those artistic pathways are very much under attack um, and it's interesting what you say about the history of what had happened at Westerly High School and that for ten, uh, nearly a decade there have been no curricular drama teaching. There are certainly whole swathes of this country and often uh, areas of this country which um, in my view, would benefit from drama teaching, uh, where no schools are now teaching curricular drama at all. Uh, and certainly, in, in the last six years, 3,000 drama teachers have been made redundant. I mean, that's, that's a huge figure. Uh, it's fewer for music and art, but it's still a problem. So it's interesting that you've managed to reintroduce that program within a public school. Um, problem the terminology with public school in this country which is quite the opposite. Um, so that's private. But, but, but um, uh, so, uh, and I taught in several um, state schools uh, quite near here, and the problem has been how to keep drama on the curriculum. Uh, and then when it hasn't been allowed to be kept on the curriculum, then it's been pushed off curriculum. And gradually, of course, it will die, and you see some dying. Community is a difficult word, but you'll see how that affects the school community. So I'm intrigued how you, how you were able to reintroduce that, or what sort of support you got from management within the school, um, because that's also a problem here, I think, from my own limited experiences. You know, did the management support that? Were they, were they actively supportive? Did they promote that to the parental base or to the student base? I think, so I'll start with the positive. Um, our superintendent of the schools is an artist himself. He's a musician. So okay. he's very supportive right. in terms of, you know, kind words and letting us basically have free reign to develop the curriculum mm. as long as we stayed within the parameters of, you know, the, the government mm. core curriculum um, standards. standards. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but the negative side is we have not seen that financially yet. So right now we're a grant funded program and we received this large sum of money from the Rhode Island Foundation. Now as a theater company, we're trying to think of the next steps because if the theater company can't continue to fund this program forever or we won't be able to do professional programming because uh, we can't just afford to do both. So just finding, showing them that there's a need and I think to speak to your question, um, um, to speak to your question about um, drama programs being cut, it hurts me not just because I'm a theater maker, but because I feel like everyone could learn to communicate mm. if we only took theater classes. Mm. You know, I one of my teachers um, and beloved mentors in New York City has been venturing into the corporate world because these CEOs aren't communicating on a higher level and they're not experiencing empathy or or if they are they don't know how to name the emotion and actually you know hear people and not just not just hear but listen and absorb and I think that's something that we as actors innately do um, so yeah I don't know the answer but I 
I feel you, and I hope mm. that I hope that mm. we can just continue to to convince people. Also, just the how unique live theater is. You know, it's not like watching a movie or mm. something that you can pause or mute or leave the room or disengage. You know, you're hearing us speak, and we're sharing the same breath, and it, each performance is so unique. And I think mm. that's like really special. Mm. Uh, I think another positive. Um, thing that's, that's come from this uh, collaboration as uh, the superintendent um, wanting, in, in a time where even the school right now, mm -hmm. this year, is being cut uh, about a million dollars. That one school, is, it, or the, the, the public schools of Westerly, which includes the middle school, elementary, and, mm -hmm. and the high school. Uh, and this superintendent has to make changes because of that cut. Uh, but he's still pushing forward with this program and saying that this is necessary and this isn't sh the first thing that should be on the chopping block. In many cases in the United States as well, mm -hmm. theater and the arts are the very first thing. Um, and he's taking the, this opposite approach. Uh, in using his words, he says, these pathways are like Velcro. And the more that we have, the more we can have the students actually latch on to something and want to come back the next day to mm -hmm. school because of that one thing that they have that's beyond the classroom, that's beyond mm -hmm. just, okay, I have to go because I have to go because I, my parents told me I shouldn't drop out and the teachers told me I shouldn't drop out, so maybe I shouldn't drop out. Eventually, you know, some of those students will drop out because they don't have anything keeping them there. Mm -hmm. And this Velcro uh, 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 metaphor is saying that there are things beyond the curriculum that students need to be able to, something tangible that they say, that's the reason why I'm going to my classes mm -hmm. so that I can do the after school mm -hmm. activities, so that I can be in the play, so that I can share these moments in the after school programs. Um, and having a theater class in the curriculum is just another, uh, another link of Velcro, mm -hmm. uh, to use his, his words. Um, and so he's putting so much faith in, in his knowing that that arts are, are necessary for mm -hmm. education. That mm -hmm. arts education and arts in general are necessary for a, a more well-rounded and a positive experience in education. Uh, and saying, I'm, I'm taking that leap of faith uh, and I'm putting, uh, this semester yet, the, the school did actually start to put money into the program uh, of a small amount, but it shows that's, that's the mm -hmm. ball rolling, that's the mm -hmm. beginning. And he's saying, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm investing in you now, not just uh, uh, emotionally, and just being behind you and say good work, mm -hmm. but actually starting to put money in and with uh, going to the school council to say, we need more money for this, mm -hmm. and this is why. Mm -hmm. The empathy is going up, the, the student understanding is going up. The people in the theater program are all still in the theater program where several of them were very high risk dropouts, mm -hmm. and they're still there, and they're graduating. Mm -hmm. um, the, the case of the student that we showed earlier, this is her senior year, mm -hmm. and she was on the road to not graduate. She was on the road to drop mm -hmm. out uh, or just flunk out, yeah. and she is graduating this year. Wow, um, and doing much better this semester than I heard from her her mm. uh, teachers ever mm. ever before. And so that tangible uh, showing of how this program is helping her in every other aspect and helping other students in every other aspect of their uh, high school education it is the starting point of showing the the board, the the government, the the local entities, and and hopefully trickling out that these are not just uh, cool things that they get to do. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's but not just entertainment. I mean, in a school of 800 kids where so many kids mm -hmm. kind of feel lost in the shuffle mm -hmm. or feel like they don't belong because being other or being different means bad in many cases in their heads. Right. Um, mm -hmm. Our kids call each other family. Mm -hmm. So. That's that's our yeah. that's the, 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 the hope and the and the faith that we have comes from that and that's the reason why we're we're seeing the successes and that we're pushing forward for further successes. Mm -hmm. yeah. So it's the propagandizing of theatre really and how we go about that. The difficult yeah. thing about that though is that, that, that uh, you know, that case has been made for a long mm -hmm. time. The interesting mm -hmm. thing and that's not to negate no. the point. Right. But the interesting thing is why it it's still being dropped, why the arts mm -hmm. are still being mm -hmm. dropped. Mm -hmm. And, and it seems to me in this country, mm. sorry, this is not a question, this is a... But in this country, it seems to me that, that, that the arguments for mm. including the arts become ever more right-wing. Mm. So they, you know, they become mm. ever more around, well, it's, you know, an economic thing, it's around, you know, building mm. profession mm. and so on and so forth. Mm. And I'm just wondering, I'm trying to find a, a point of connection, is it? 
there is a question. John Ken point of connection between the two speakers. Mm. And it seems to me that there is something around um, professional engagement that, that is in both instances. So the archive where you're really capturing uh, the kind of professional engagement, uh, uh, high, quali- uh, high production values and so on that is in, in code. Your enga- engagement, which is clearly h- high quality professional engagement with those people. And I'm just wondering, because I, you know, I was a drama teacher, I tra- you know, trained drama teacher for years, and there's nothing worse than a crap drama lesson. You know, you may as well not bother. You know, you know, it, 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 and you know, you alluded to that. But I'm just wondering if there was a way of thinking about TYA, the teaching artists, that is around a different kind of conceptualization of profession. No, there was a question. I just needed to write first because I, I, I find it really baffling. You know. Yeah. I mean, one of the things that comes to mind. you uh, I don't want to speak you but for I've done a couple TYA tours and I feel like kids are the most honest audience you're ever going to perform in front of you know if they don't like something they're out if they like something they're speaking they're like active they are participating and so I think you know exposing more kids to theater will lead to hopefully more adults who want the arts to flourish and I actually had some, it, I mean, this is a response and a question as well. And sometimes um, in, my, in my context, I involve professional artists to work with teenagers and to devise a piece or to do projects. And sometimes, although they are very, pre- they, I mean, uh, artists, uh, actually because they haven't worked with young people before and their approaches they require differences because of the people they work with, but they, they were not ready to, to do that, so sometimes uh, the process was not really as enjoyable mm-hmm. as we expected. Mm-hmm. Um, so, so in that case, I I was wondering about what are the, what is the kind of uh, the experts expert knowledge or the, the the expertise that is required in working in this kind of context, which is distinguished from very professional artists working in their own sphere. So I, my question is, when, when it comes to um, your projects and you work, you, you work, you go in as a professional artist to work with, with, with the high school students, and what are the, what are, do you think are the distinct approaches that you take, which are different from maybe other professional artists who have been exposed to uh, this kind of working context? I mean, have you thought about this? Uh, actually, yes. Uh, uh, Elena and myself both have a, a teaching background. Um, I have my master's in English and was a, a college professor of, of English for a number of years. Uh, Elena's uh, done several programs with uh, both um, uh, elementary to high school age students. Um, uh, in Artists in residency. So. Yeah. And so being professional um, theater makers, and having that background, that was a major reason why we were brought in to this company very specifically uh, because of that. And with our, our uh, basically because we are the head of this program, the funneling of the lens through us, the, the other professionals that we bring in are already vetted. And so it's, it's people that we know that are professionals and have been doing it for a while, but also have some kind of understanding of how to speak to the younger audience, how to speak to a student audience, as opposed to fellow theater makers uh, or for fellow professionals, and I think that's that's a big difference because I've, you know, in, in my studies I've come across professionals who came in and I they're great and they were wonderful and they're super directors and I've seen their work and they're so fantastic and I didn't get a thing from them. Yeah. They could not give me anything, any of their insights or any of their knowledges because they didn't have the vocabulary or the understanding of how to speak to myself as a student or my fellow students. And so knowing that, we really made sure that not only are we bringing in just any professional who will speak, but uh, professionals who have either an understanding of how to speak or especially the experience or any training um, uh, aspects. Yeah, I think adaptability is the word that comes to mind for me because, you know, being an actor, you have to be quick on your feet and be able to, like, improvise if necessary. 
And you know, I had a bit of a learning curve. I was teaching harmonies to the kids in the musical. And with a professional company, you're like, great, you got that, <laughs> moving on. Next harmony, and they were like, no, I don't have that. Like, I was like, oh, right, okay. So how can we break that down? Can we record it? You know, what are the different ways in which we learn? So, you know, auditory, can we write it down? And just, you know, adapting to, to their skill set because, you know, in any cast of professionals or amateurs, you're gonna have people varying abilities. So yeah, adaptability, I would say, is my biggest one. We have a question here. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, well, yeah, thank you, everyone, for such clear and engaging discussions. Um, it was, it was just a question about ASI, actually, as you know, I'm a huge, huge fan of this archive, and I've used it as much as I possibly can in, in teaching, and, you know, I mean, everybody can see how unbelievably swish it is, but it's also, I think, that, that degree of, it, it encourages such a degree of reflection and inclusivity, it's like, it's almost like sort of intercultural empathy embodied in a digital tool. There's no contradictions in there. But, but, but on, on the basis of that, I think, you know, the, the fact that you focus so much on the viewing experience, here comes the question, how, how are you sort of envisioning, or I suppose even perhaps thinking about practically organizing the viewer experience for young audiences? Because I know, for example, working with, with, with one of your colleagues, of course, that, that ASIA also sometimes becomes, uh, which I think is hugely exciting, a platform for um, sort of intercultural Skype classes where kids in Singapore speak to kids in Korea and find very different kind of things to get excited about in these productions. But I sort of wonder also about the kind of, I suppose, the, the, if, if you're on your own and you're watching this production, that's going to be a hugely different experience from if it's used in class and it's sort of guided by a teacher so what what are you what are your thoughts on on how to how to organize this, this uh, viewing experience yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know if I can really answer the question yet because uh, no, of course. yeah Just but uh, this is a very very um, very helpful uh, comments and and uh, questions for me Things through because, yeah. Uh, yeah. Oh, actually, relations that's but I, yeah. what I was wondering about with, yeah. with do you do you know who's using the archive? I mean, presumably you get to the sense of who's it, it says of who's it for? Is it sort of um, the, I mean, the, the, the target, yeah, the target, so, and sort of geographical spread and things like that? So, I mean, presumably that you will, that data must be available because I, mean, um, I, I wonder whether obviously for us, sort of you know, interacting with the archive, it has a very different sort of uh. Sort of used to a sort of different kind of resonance to somebody in Singapore or somebody in Korea or, or whatever. Um, I think there's a bit of it sort of um, if, if, if within the sort of Anglophone world, we can call it where, where people speak English and nothing else. Yeah, there, there is this kind of, you're seeing there's something which is other, uh, and and I kind of in a way it's it's a way of sort of expanding sort of possibilities and opening things up. There is obviously there's, there's also a history of of you know, Western appropriation of, of we look at these sort of the, these examples of non-Western Shakespeare and use them to kind of reinvigorate or spice up, you know, kind of Peter Brook or whoever, sort of onwards. Um, which I mean, there's there's all sorts of you know pros and cons around that. But I just wonder how does that those kind of concerns fit in to so how the archive works. Is that too <laughs> it's a big yeah, yeah, yeah. It is a big question. I've been reading and reading on the on the, the culturalism and the, the, the politics of interculture, you know, the, the issues of representation, the exploitation, etc., etc. Et et and um, uh, I think um, for me, um, at first, as as a Korean. It's easier for me to, um, in a way, access English materials than materials from other parts of Asia because yeah. of the language barrier. When we meet, we speak English. Uh, and uh, so the, the kind of possibility of hold on to the materials produced, performances produced in other parts of Asia is quite little, in a way. Mm -hmm. So to have that access to performances, for me, it was really eye-opening to, to see all the materials as we were creating this archive. <gasps> Something from Malaysia, the Philippines, and, and uh, I, I was very foreign to it, although 
I call this massive region Asia and I'm Asian. Mm -hmm. I felt very foreign to it and for me it was a very new experience to be engaged with these materials mm -hmm. and to create a, 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 a platform where these interactions can become possible, become mm -hmm. possible is a meaningful starting point. Mm -hmm. And uh, in a way, instead of talking about interculturalism between West and East, within Asia, yeah, if, yeah, it yeah, becomes, yeah. if it becomes possible mm -hmm. to begin to interact within mm -hmm. in Asia, becomes inter-Asia dialogues, yeah. I think this is a, a meaningful starting point and then it can open up new ways of talking about interculturalism. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, yes. I'll, I'll, I'll put that more positively, so, actually. Yeah, yeah, we, I think yeah. we won't sound critical. I was actually thinking the thing that comes up over and over again is, is, is about ownership, isn't it? It's about who has ownership. And I think mm. this is mm. really at the heart of a lot of the sort of mm. uh, dialogues around what Helen was talking about. And what you're talking about is it's, it seems that there's, the, the danger is coming in. To, we, we are, you, you don't have ownership of this material, and we do. Um, and it seems to me that the great thing about Shakespeare is nobody, everybody has ownership, and nobody does. Mm. Yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. This, and it's actually this sort of this, it is actually ideal in between space, where we actually say we don't have all the answers. And it, we're, we're sort of re-encountering this again <laughs> as strangers. It, it, it seems to me that that's a, actually a place where empathy possibly becomes possible. So, I was, yeah, so I was sort of con a bit concerned I was, sound as if I was being critical. I think yeah, but I think it's really interesting that mm. I have to speak English when I meet my other Asian friends. Mm. And we, through yeah. Shakespeare, we, we uh, begin to understand each other's approaches. Mm -hmm. I, I yeah. think this is, I don't know how to explain mm -hmm. it, but Shakespeare can become a very useful mm -hmm. uh, medium, medium for us to, to mm -hmm. build relationships yeah. in that sense. So, so yeah, this is very, very yeah. interesting. Yeah. Uh, do, do, so do you, do, do you think, this is interesting having conversations with my Chinese friends about this who live in mainland China, who have a very different, um, perspective and experience of Shakespeare, do you think there's a danger that there's some sense of um, uh, colonial culturalism that comes with Shakespeare? Does Shakespeare bring all that baggage with him? To be honest. <laughs> to, 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 you say, you know, Singapore was a British colony, you know, and the British imperial history in China is muddy, to say the least. <laughs> um, is there a danger there? Does that switch off a young audience and how, or an, any audience, and how do you get, and all, and all these parts of Asia are totally disparate, as disparate as Europe. I mean, it's, that's the reality. Um, uh, when you inject uh, a colonial heritage, what, what effect does that have? I think we, uh, for me, I have been having this um, questions for mm. decades and decades. Mm. Um, <laughs> Because for us, um, uh, modernization mm. equals westernization, yeah. mm. rationalization. Mm. Um, so to kind of search for what, what kind of what kind of historical process we have been through, and what is from here and mm. what is not, mm. it's very muddy, muddy, and it's. Uh, Sometimes it becomes very uh, conservative and nationalistic, mm -hmm. and sometimes it becomes so uh, little, I mean, it, so um, less than mm -hmm. little sensitive mm -hmm. to these issues. Mm -hmm. So um, these issues are um, always there. I think I would say this became this was a really big debate in 1990s in Korea, for example. From now on. I mean, these days after millennium, we talk about why Shakespeare mm -hmm. and what does Shakespeare mean to us. We talk about this all the time. Mm -hmm. But as Lianu mentioned, I think also there is a different stage mm -hmm. moving on with the globalization and all this changing of the context. Mm -hmm. We don't only talk about nation by nation or culture by culture because it's mixing so much uh, that oh, some theater makers think, oh, maybe we can. We can make Shakespeare, and it's not only for the domestic audience in Korea. Mm -hmm. Maybe we can mm -hmm. we can go and tour yeah. around. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. This this idea of the mm -hmm. the borders mm -hmm. kind of are changing 
quite a lot. So there is there are these problems and very um, problematic issues uh, embedded in, in in this area. But at the same time, it's that's not all of it. That's kind of tying my legs in order not to move. <laughs> There's the, there are something more happening, and the, especially with the young generations growing up using this media, uh, social media, YouTube, uh, get access to the materials from us. I mean, this is, it's, a, it's, quite, it's quite complex and um, not quite neat mm -hmm. to, to say. So I think it's totally a valid question and very important question, which is we always at the back of my mind, but at the same time, I am trying to think of what it can enable, um, mm -hmm. in yeah. a sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Yes. So. Well, I'm afraid it's time for us to claim ownership of our lunch. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so if you could please yeah. join me in yeah. thanking. Yeah.